Hi everyone and welcome back to Returning to Study. This is episode two. Josh here from Melbourne, Australia. Today I'm joined by Heidi from Orville Donga. She's a former Sydney girl and now space in a regional centre and she returned to study as a mature age student and also has gone back as well as a graduate student. So first I just wanted to say welcome to Heidi. She's my first special guest on the show. So might just tell us a little bit about yourself, Heidi, how you maybe first moved into tertiary education how old you were when you did that, and then maybe what you've done since then, and then we'll jump into the more formal questions after that. Sure, Josh. Uh, I have officially two and a half degrees at the moment. I first uh, did a Bachelor of Business, University of Western Sydney, so that was my, my undergraduate degree. I subsequently, or a few years after that, did a Master's of Taxation with University of New South Wales, which was a distance education course. And presently I'm halfway through a grad cert in applied positive psychology at Sydney Uni, which is a combination of face-to-face weekly lectures and also five-day residentials. Cool, cool. So how old were you when you did your first undergrad? Because I'm pretty sure you went back in your early 20s, so that would qualify as a mature age student these days. Yeah, mature in inverted commas. I was I was about 23, so what happened for me was I left school in year 10 and I worked for a, a secretary as a secretary for a number of years, making a lot of coffee for men. And I kind of got the feeling that I was a bit capable of doing doing more than that. So, yeah, I was... 23 uh, when I decided to go back to full-time study. I was sick of making rubbish money and I was just basically bored, I suppose. I was pretty pretty unengaged. I think that might be a reason why a lot of people decide to go back a few years out of school because if the job opportunity is there or you're just not that interested in what you're doing, education can really open up some maybe other interest areas or anything like that. So we might just jump into the more formal part of the interview. So this is going to be similar through every interview going forward, a similar bunch of questions, because I want people to know kind of what they're going to get when they listen to an episode and what they can expect as far as takeaways from the guests. So we've kind of already covered the first question. I mean, why did you decide to go back? You kind of articulated that quite well, that you just basically wanted to broaden your horizons and you were pretty much just bored. Was there anything else driving that? Did you have any maybe external pressures to go back or is it mostly more an intrinsic thing? Uh, I think apart from the things that I've I've said I think I I had the opportunity so I had the support from my my family to move back home and actually be funded uh, for study which as you know study is pretty expensive so I had that in my favour and when it came to doing my my master's the reason I I went on and, and did the postgraduate studies was that an opportunity arose where my employer offered to fund the postgrad studies, which of course was a full fee paying course. And my partner at the time was an itinerant worker, so he was away all the time. So it seemed like a good idea at the at the time for me. And the other reasons were it opened up opportunities in my day job for for promotions. It was very much the done thing in the, the professional world to to do that. In relation to the grad cert, I was actually looking for a career change. So obviously moving from law into a psychology school is is quite a difference. I wanted to move into life and resilience coaching. And at that time, Sydney University was the only course that was offering that level of coaching. Right. Well, that's a great answer. I guess next, the thing that I think a lot of people will be tuning in for, if nothing else, and I know this from personal experience, having just signed up to uni and Just a full disclosure, Heidi and I know each other quite well personally. We're friends and she would know that I'm relatively tech savvy, particularly when it comes to the internet specifically. I was completely blown out by technology. (laughs) How did you find maybe the more recent parts of your university course comparing to those older times when you went back to study to begin with? Because I found it completely different. It's like a different world, how the courses are delivered and how you apply and how you stay on top of finances with the university and all that. How did you find the tech side? Uh, I actually didn't have any problems at all and I was I was a little bit surprised to hear you say that you were having those difficulties. I suppose the thing that I noticed with Sydney University, well obviously things have progressed as the years gone by, like back in the day we had to physically photocopy readings out of libraries which was a nightmare, but at Sydney Uni 
everything was online. I suppose the size of the system can be a little bit daunting if you don't know what you're looking for, but on the flip side, I found all of the resources were there one way or the other and things like being able to download your lecture notes and your lecture slides each week from the lecturer, things like that were just fabulous. I guess probably the biggest hurdle for me in relation to going back to study as an undergrad and it wasn't the technology, the, the biggest hurdle for me was that I didn't actually know how to study. So I'd left school in year 10 and even in those years never applied myself in any way, shape or form. So it was actually very, a very, very, uh, quite a painful and difficult learning curve for me. So I did actually have to fail a couple of subjects before I learnt more about myself and my learning styles and, and what worked for me and what didn't. So they were probably my, my bigger challenges. But yeah, interesting to hear about your technology issues. I think maybe when I have someone say it back to me like that, I think part of the problem was that I deal with a lot of websites every day I don't want to take up too much time explaining myself, but I think I deal with some of the best and most well-designed products out there online. I use a lot of the Google suites and bunches of other things that are really well made online. And then you get into the back of a maybe slightly kind of clandestine system of a university that they haven't modernized all of it. So some parts yeah, of the gotcha. site, the public facing parts of the site are amazingly modern and everything behind it is just maybe more frustrating for me that it doesn't work the way I would love it to work. And I just found that really off-putting and it almost meant that I was going to choose one university over another just purely because of the ease of entry. But I don't want to dwell on myself too much, but that maybe explains it. It's good that you actually challenged me on that, I guess. <laughs> mm. And you probably set a fairly high bar in relation to your technology requirements. So possibly your, your average mature age student, age student may, not, may not find that. But yeah, I guess if you were a less tech-savvy person, having to go online and to seek out all those resource materials and fill out all those forms, I, I could understand why that would be would be daunting if you weren't used to it. Definitely. So maybe just moving on, was there any surprise benefits? And I think this is going to be maybe the big takeaway for people, I hope, going forward, because there is a big school of thought out there these days that essentially, well, there's two. Either you don't actually need a formal education and you can completely educate yourself, I mean, and Heidi knows I'm the ultimate bookworm. Like I've read hundreds of books in the last few years. But I think there's something else about actual formal education that it teaches you a rigor and a study method and a method of actually learning, kind of a meta-learning thing for not to sound too esoteric about it. Was there any kind of benefit you've seen from the pure learning process that you've taken into day-to-day -day life, like how you learn or how you interact with maybe other people that are trying to learn the similar things to you? Is there any big takeaways for you out of the study? Uh, yep, I've got a, a couple of comments on that. So when I was doing the Masters, that actually demanded independent thinking. So that was a little bit of a shock to me. I wasn't really used to doing that. And I think the biggest thing that I took away from that, that process was learning research skills and the ability to be resourceful and to find answers on my own. And I think the ability to be resourceful and find answers is more important than knowing the knowledge at that time. I'll say that again because I think it's really important. So the ability to find answers, to be able to be resourceful, to go out on your own and look for stuff is more important than the knowledge and the answers at the time. Because you think about it, if you go and do a degree, say, for okay, so I was doing law, areas of law. Obviously, in five years' time, that's, that's going to change. And that's probably the case for pretty much any uni course you do. But if you, if you pick up that ability to research and be resourceful and go out and find things and, you know, go down rabbit holes and things like that, I think that's really important. And it's a portable skill that you can take it anywhere. And it's something that's actually made me a lot more confident and resourceful in a, an employment situation and even in life situations, I suppose you could say. That's an excellent answer. And I know I probably just got a little bit sidetracked in my question then, but there's one thing I've been wanting to ask you specifically because I remember you actually telling me a funny story about when you first went back to uni, some of the people that you were interacting with and your study partner at the time. How did you find just going back being – because, I mean, there's a massive maturity difference between someone that's maybe – 18 or maybe 19-ish when they go to uni straight out of school and someone who's 21, 22 and older. 
how did you find that transition of getting along with people when that, even though it's only a four-year gap, is actually a massive maturity gap? Yeah, personally, it wasn't a huge problem um, when I was 23. Being such a youthful looking 23, most of the 18 year olds <laughs> literally didn't know that I, was, that I wasn't straight out of school the same as them. I think the bigger problems definitely arise when you're like 40 and you're in a group of people studying that may be straight out of school. There, there are definitely issues there. In terms of socialising for the postgrad courses, I didn't really socialise with them. It was more, I suppose, a, an opportunity to network and also for postgrad. If you're doing face-to-face -face lectures at night, everybody's pretty darn tired if they've been at work all day. So it's it's not sort of like a really bright environment, you know, the six to, to nine p.m. course. So most of them are pretty pretty much in a hurry to get home. But just to to come back to that issue of people that have worked compared to people that have come straight out of school. So I, I found the biggest difference there is. It's the real world experience. So you're sitting next to someone who's learning all this theory, but they only sort of half get it. They only get it some things by rote. So I found that that was probably the, the main difference. So things like when kids are talking about gap years, I think they're incredibly valued because the, the benefit that employment or even travelling and, and world life experience can bring to your your theoretical learning experience, I think, is invaluable. That's excellent. I'm sure that that's one of the main things I want as the series of shows moves on is for people who are mature age to realise that you're, you might not be maybe as in tune with your mathematics or any of those skills that come straight out of an advanced kind of course at the end of school if you're doing advanced math or anything, but you have an entire schema that young people straight out of school just seriously can't understand and that's how to apply something theoretical, particularly, I mean, I can speak for business courses. What I learned at uni, it only sunk in at the most minor level because my schema about the rest of the world was just artificial, really, because I was forming it out of the books when I actually went into the business world. It's a completely different universe almost, and I can see if I was to go back to school that I would just have so much more reference for what I was learning, and I'm sure that's the same in psychology and law, that if you can bring some real-world perspective to theory, you've got the, almost the ultimate combination. Mm, absolutely. So is there anything else you wanted to say, Heidi, just about maybe people that are feeling a little bit iffy about maybe going back to uni? What's one thing that you really look back on your time and now that you're kind of back into that scheme again of going back through another graduate sort of program? Well, I hope you don't mind, but I've actually prepared five really quick tips. Oh, um, that's awesome. First one yeah, is... that's great. I'm down for that. <laughs> <laughs> the first one is for people that are thinking about it's still at the thinking stage, my response would be do it and do it now. So if you're in a position to do it before spouses come along, mortgages, kids, etc., that's fantastic. If you're not in a position to be that early in your, your life cycle, then you're going to need a team. So you're going to need the support of your spouse, the support of your family, etc. So, yep, either do it alone and do it now or, or do it in a, a team. The second thing I'd like to suggest is that Depending on your learning style, if you're doing face-to-face -face courses, you may want to consider getting an MP3 recorder and recording your lectures. So for me personally, uh, because I'm so reflective and I need to think about things, sometimes I need to hear things several times over, I would actually record the lectures and would listen to those commuting. Or alternately, I would actually read some of the academic papers out loud and record them on the MP3 and revisit them later. Some of them are so complex, I really need to listen to them in great detail to get my head around them. The third thing is in relation to critical dates. Critical dates are critical. So you really need to be aware of things like the last date to add a subject, or more importantly, the last date that you can withdraw from a subject without penalty. And that means if you withdraw after this date, if, if you're not coping, etc., you will get fail on your transcript and very few people want that. I have a few, but I'm sure that your listeners don't want it. So critical dates, can't emphasise that enough. The fourth thing is do your foundation work. So going back as a, an adult, you may have written pretty cool essays when you were at school or may not, as the case may be. Don't be too proud to undertake some of the introductory training that the universities offer, whether it's research skills, whether it's essay writings, 
essay writing. So me, for example, I went from business and law background and I went into a, a faculty of psychology, did really badly in my first essays because the, the way that they write is entirely different. So don't be too tough on yourself and accept any, any assistance in relation to writing for uni. And the final thing is ask for help if you need it. So ask early and ask often. Universities don't want to see you fail. I know you don't want to see or your listeners don't want to see you fail. If you find yourself in any difficulty during semester, whether it's you know personal issue or issues with your studies, act sooner rather than later. Talk to your lecturer. Uh, a lot of the universities will have free counselling services on campus as well, etc. So ask for help early. And that's it. There are my five hot tips for the day. Those are really awesome. And I might have to get Heidi to email those to me so I can put those in the show notes. That's great. And just for a tip for anyone who's thinking I don't have an MP3 recorder, you can actually just use the recorder of Evernote. Get the Evernote app if you're an iOS user, and I'm sure there's a voice recorder on Android devices now. As long as the faculty of whatever subject you're studying is happy for you to have something turned on, definitely do that. Because the other thing is for me, I know that I, as I've probably spoken to Heidi about in the past, I speed everything up when I listen to it because I'm used to that. So that's been a learning style for me that's made, actually increased my ability to cover things that I've already covered, listen to it once at normal speed, and then if I need a refresher, I can speed it up. So I know that's getting a little bit more technical, but there, there's all those options out there now that maybe I never had when I was studying in the early 2000s. So Absolutely, and you can just go to Officeworks or some, somewhere and if, if you don't have a, an iPhone or you want a mp3 quarter just go and buy one for twenty dollars it's really no big deal these days that's it and just to finish up i just wanted to throw out there a little bit of simple math that i did for my postgrad subjects i'm doing two of them and i worked out that if i do an entire semester and i break it down into weeks where i'm actually in session university is costing me i know a hundred dollars a week or something (laughs) and there's not much else that costs people a hundred dollars a week that they wouldn't ask for help about straight away whether it's a bad bill or something's going on in your life that's costing you that amount of money a week, you would sort that out then. So I would, just on top of what Heidi said, and it's kind of from what she was saying, it's really spurred me on to think this. If something's super simple to sort out, you really just need to maybe get over your ego a little bit and maybe some damage to your ego and just ask those simple questions as soon as you think about it, not put it off and not debate with yourself, oh, I should ask or shouldn't I ask, just do it. If it takes less than a few minutes to do just put it out there because it's costing you money every week that you're there and it can also cost your academic record if you decide to put things off, as Heidi said earlier. So that's about all I've got to say. So Heidi, thank you so, so much for joining me. It's been a pleasure <laughs> and hopefully you might come back in the future and let us know how your study's going. Thanks. Check us out on iTunes, returning to study and returningtostudy.com. Thanks, Heidi. See you later. Thanks, Josh.